Today, my guest is Roberto Gutierrez, who is a phenomenal artist. That means he's a painter, and he is from Los Angeles. He's a rare breed. Please help me welcome Roberto Gutierrez. Thank you. Thank Hello, you very much. Hello, Roberto. Hi. So I want to start the conversation by talking about uh, where you were born and um, where you grew up at. Born and raised in Los Angeles, uh, Angelino, mm -hmm. uh, sort of the heart of L.A., what is now Chinatown. From there, I, I traveled with my family, of course. Uh, we went from Lincoln Heights to Boyle Heights in East L.A., went to Roosevelt High School, went to East L.A. College, and, and before that, into the Marine Corps. So how was uh, Los Angeles in the 50s? It was a, a melting pot. We had uh, French that were living there. They've been there for almost 100 years. African Americans, Chinese Americans, uh, Mexican Americans. So how did that affect you with all these cultures around you? I had some curiosity. I, I wondered, and I would never got any answers. On the corner of North Broadway and Ord Street, there was a French uh, bakery there. And I always wondered, how did the French get here? Not knowing my history. Why is this Italian market here? How did they get here? So all those types of questions were rolling in my head. So now you are a former Marine. Yes. When did you join the Marines? August 8th, 1961 to be specific. And I got out in December 1966. I re-enlisted. Most of my friends uh, were going to Vietnam. I had 30 days to think about it. I decided I want to be where my friends are, so that's how that happened. And then when you came home, how was the... the Transition? Yeah, to transition back into... Civilian life? Yes. Uh, rather confusing. That time, this would be 66. The uh, Chicano movement was starting. Cesar Chavez was starting up. All I knew was was how to be a Marine. So when I came out, came out there were all these people that were going to college. And they had these different ideas. And it took me a long time to realize that they were right and I was wrong in my way of thinking. I was very conservative. I thought they were going against the government. Uh, what is friend, it that they were thinking then? Well, they were thinking, why are so many Latinos uh, being sent to Vietnam and getting killed over there in racials in comparison to other groups? I never thought about that. Mm. We were all one group, Marine Corps Green. So not till I started getting a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more educated, a little bit more uh, going to college and talking to various groups that I understand where they were coming from. When did you start painting? 1968. I had, at that time, Lyndon Baines Johnson's Great Society had put out the GI Bill. I had uh, childhood friends who were very good artists, naturally, and I always wanted to draw or paint. I never knew how to draw a stick. I get out of the Marine Corps and I realize, oh, I have a, an option. So I took one class at uh, East LA College. It was a night class in drawing. And I realized that I really loved this type of entertainment, whatever you want to call it. I, it was a drawing class. It was a great artist by the name of Gordon Rice. And I just kept taking classes. So I spent four years in a two year in a two-year college, because I took classes over and over and over, just enjoyed it. All in art? All in art. I'm not too hot on academics, never have. Then I went, after I realized I spent four years there, sucked everything up that I could, I went to Cal State LA and finished all my, all my art class. Didn't finish the degree. I don't have a degree from, from Cal State LA, but I got what I needed. When did you decide it was painting that you wanted to do? Just a cattle. I looked down there and I, you know, I had been taking all these drawing classes and really enjoyed it. And I thought, hmm, I think I had try this painting stuff. All of this is serendipitous. All of this is by chance. I had some wonderful instructors starting uh, with uh, this wonderful uh, painter. His name is Louis Lanetta. He's not the late Louis Lanetta. He's good in drawing, good in painting. Roberto Chavez who was a painter in his own right. His paintings are now in the Smithsonian. My uh, um, mentor, Don Chipperfield, who was in charge of, de of design and painting, Louis taught me how to paint. And I thought, oh, he's going to teach me how to do techniques and stuff. No, he gave me, he squeezed paint on, these, on this palette. He said, look, you're just going to get some paint. You're going to start doing this and this. That was no technique, no nothing. He wanted me to paint from the inside out. 
he did not want me to be a copy of Louis Lanetta. He wanted a Roberto Gutierrez. He stayed away from direct assistant. Do it this way, do it no. Sink or swim, I'll give you an idea. Do you remember your first painting? I still have it in the house. It's a lousy portrait, self-portrait, very badly done. But I kept it anyway because it was my first one, and I look at it and I still cringe. Speaking as a painter and as a former military man and being from East L.A., you break the stereotype. You know, if I'm thinking somebody from military, serving six years is a long time. Yeah. That means you've got so much stuff downloaded in you that there is a certain slant that you bring. But at the same time, coming from East L.A., a Chicano uh, a community, that gives you a whole different perspective. When I think of Chicano from East L.A. or by the bridge, I think tats. I think, you know, wife beater shirts. That's the um, stereotype we've bought into. When I think of Marines, I think of camouflage and the, the rifle. But when I look at your art, what I see is emotion. As a man who has um, embodied all of this stuff, how do you describe yourself as an artist? I didn't realize that my, my paintings, my artwork was helping me with my PTSD. Years later, lots of therapy, and I started connecting the dots. It's a way to dispel some of that rage and anger and confusion and stuff. Most of my education, I think, Art education came from East L.A., and I had the kind of professors that said, we're not going to train you. You're going to train yourself, but we're going to give you a guidance. So I kept all that emotion. You know, there are artists, Latino artists, that are very intellectual, and then you see their painting, you can see that they're, they're intellects. For me, that is dry as a cracker. Latinos across the country and across Central and South America, we're emotional people. Chilean or Puerto Rican or Mexicano or whatever. We have that fire in our belly, that's who we are. You know, you get us pissed off, you better run. <laughs> what was that feeling of putting brush to paint to canvas for you? You know, when you first started doing that, how did that make you feel? I didn't realize it at the time. All I knew is when I finished those, this is all East LA stuff, when I finished those classes in painting, I didn't have the anxiety of the panic attacks. You know, my PTSD, it works differently for, for every man, woman who's in the military who sees combat and stuff. It's different for everyone. My experience was the only way I could deal with some of that, and I couldn't tell anybody then. This is before they called it PTSD. The military was scrambling to help vets because they were committing suicide mm -hmm. and acting out. Good old Mota and, and, and you know. <laughs> that's and, weed, people, that's weed. You know, and... and, 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 and <laughs> and drunks and, and drinks, you yes. know, I'd be shit faced the next morning. I, and so that quieted everything. I was working, I was a functioning crazy man. I wasn't hurting anybody. I didn't go to jail. But, you know, I, I realized later, I'm pushing all that down. The only time the demons were quiet is when I painted. painted. And when you started painting with all this stuff going on, all this anxiety, all this um, panic in you, were the first things you painted, other than your self-portrait, were they um, about the war, or did you focus on something completely different? Um, it was about the war. I painted things uh, sort of a roundabout way. For example, I did this painting. I bought frames at a second-hand store, and then I, I had a cat then, so I get all the tins from the cat food that are very soft, and I'd nail all these cat tins around the frame so it looked like armor. And then I would get a canvas, and I, I, it was masonite board, and I'd cut the masonite to fit the, 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 the frame, and then I'd paint something on it. In this case, it would be buildings. I've always been fascinated with buildings, and these would be in color and stuff, and then I glued on tanks, and I glued on aircraft on them. And I had several of this, not thinking that I was, pro you know, projecting or thinking of the Vietnam War. I did yeah. at the time. It was, it was the 80s, I think. There was a guy by Julian Schnabel who would glue crockery on big canvases in New York. He was hot. And then he would paint images on that. So I did my own version. I said, man, that guy's really good. So I paint these buildings that were twisted and burning. And, and um, you know, I'm glad I got away from that. So the early pieces are, are very dark. If somebody would say I was going to be a professional painter and the difficulties like being an actor, it's hard. You know, like, you're not going to get rich at this stuff. 
So you got your eight to five job, but something's hankering over here. You got to paint, buddy. You got to paint. And so over 40 years, here I am. I'm so-called professional painter. Nobody ever said, Roberto, you're an artist. No one ever said that to you? I saw it. Chinatown. Uh, I had some neighbor chums, neighbor friends. There was a, a two brothers, Henry and Herman. Herman could draw. Remember, this is after World War II. There was funny books. There was Superman. There was... The comic books, All yes. the comic books. Thank you, the, the comic books. And one of them was G.I. Joe. So this is after World War, World War II. There was, you know, the bad guys with the Germans still, the bad guys with the Japanese. And so there was these combat drawings and stuff in these funny books. And this kid could draw this, these characters from his memory without the book. And I wanted to do that, and I couldn't draw a lick. That stayed with me all the way through the Marine Corps. Oh, I took one class at Roosevelt High School, the last class I had, and it was painting uh, for one semester, and I really enjoyed it, and uh, that stayed with me. So I fast forward to the Marine Corps in 1962. We land for training in the Philippine Islands, in the island of Mindanao. I'm getting off this truck, and I look up, and I see these mountains in the jungle, and they're all purple. I never saw mountains before, except in magazines, and they're purple. I didn't have a camera, I couldn't draw, and it stayed with me. Fast forward, I get out of the Marine Corps, and that stayed with me. So that's how it started. You were an artist, and nobody knew where to put you <laughs> until, <laughs> until you found the classes and then started slowly yeah. to, not, I don't want to even say figure it out, but, but unconsciously, you started gravitating to your tribe. Yes. So Very um, well put. Um, it's just fascinating because you don't have the traditional background of most artists that they kind of knew at an early age is what I want to do. I'm going to start doing it. I'm going to get to wherever I need to go to do it. For you, it was truly a unconscious thing that might not have happened had you not been in the service. Yes. So you were part of self-help graphics, which Judy Baca comes yes. from. Yes. Absolutely. Who is a phenomenal muralist. Well, yes. she's a phenomenal painter, but she has done all these murals across Los Angeles that are iconic now. Yes. And probably one of the most recognizable uh, Latina um, names in art and has gotten her own organization and is really uh, big on helping uh, community, Latinos, and young artists. I, I love Judy Baca. I don't remember exactly the same, the year that self graphic was started, but it was started as a nonprofit with a group of artists and a nun, uh, the late sister Karen Bacalero. We had no venue to show uh, artwork for people of color. And so with the artists and this Franciscan nun, they decided to do their own thing. And, and it started from there. I wanted to stay away from politics. Like I said, I was already seeing a lot of this politics and I didn't want to have anything to do with that. In the insistence of my friend, I went one day and there is this nun, and I would say an unusual nun for this time. She smoked <laughs> like a train, she cussed like a sailor. So you liked her. Oh, very much. <laughs> and she became like my surrogate mother. And I remember wonderful Saturdays there where um, I'd get there about 10 or 11 o'clock and. I'd say, Sister Karen, um, have you guys had any coffee or... No, we haven't, Roberto. Okay. So I'd march over and buy some Mexican sweet bread and coffee and stuff, and then our day would start. And then I met these fabulous artists that became my friends. If I remember correctly, they really brought in people who were not equipped to go get a regular job, and they taught them silk screening. You could go and get uh, T-shirts made there that were very reasonable. Yes. I, I just remember it being a, a wonderful organization that brought community together. They also helped artists, and they also helped people transition back into civilian life, uh, you know, either prison or, or whatever it was. But they made a difference, and they still make a difference in, in Los Angeles. The Dia de los Muertos started at Self Help Graphics. Now it's spread oh, probably wow. through all the nation, yes, yes. but especially in Coco. L.A. We have the wonderful That's right. film Coco. Well, you can thank Self Help Graphics for that. Wow. It started there. And I forget the name of the artist. Uh, originally, the guy was from Mexico. He brought uh, El Dia de los Muertos. And for many years, it was celebrated there. And from there, it's now you got Coco. Yes. I want to show, because you were gracious enough to bring 
some mm. of your work. I, I just want to show it off. Sure. If, if I can, since you didn't want to get into politics, I'm going to start with the political painting <laughs> first. So this is called Trump the Obscure. I love this shot. I, lo I love this painting. I love how you gave him roaches on his collar. I would have given him bed bugs. I noticed with your art that you don't have just one style, like the bridge or Trump or your Los Angeles stuff, that they all have, it's almost like the, the picture, the, the canvas and the painting takes on its own life. That's a good observation. You're right about that. For example, Trump is for my own self. When he first came into office, uh, it, 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 he terrified me. He should not be a president. He terrified me too. You know, I, and God. I, I agree that he has no business being a president. That's the only. Yes. That's my expression. That's the way I, I get things out. And I've had this now for a year, and I've decided that the painting needed something else. So I put the roaches coming from inside somewhere, mm. out of the collar, the white collar and into the public view, and you can make of it what you want. What I uh, like about your work is how you can either go black and white, yes. you can uh, do the grays with a little bit of color, or you can go colorful. And there we go back to how every piece of work has its own life. You know, there's some painters that they give you the same uh, flavor every picture. They might be, you know, it might be a woman, it might be a man, it might be uh, a house, but it's always the same flavor, the same kind of style. And with you, it's it's really emotional. Yes. It's really about what you were feeling emotionally as with that subject. And it, I think, is, is pretty profound stuff. Each piece you do affects me emotionally in a different way. Like, I, I look at because I've got a couple pieces in front of me. The bridge, it's white and gray and blue, and it elicits an emotion out of me. It, it, it makes me feel um, centered. Okay. There's something about it that makes me feel centered that is like, okay, this is a, a, a practical, we're going to work, we're taking care of business, we're handling whatever we have to do that. Yet, at the same time, uh, uh, it, it says to me, there are all these lines that are, are, are intersecting, which is life, you know, we, we intersect with stuff. So it, it just, it's more of an emotional piece to me than it is intellectual. Even though I see the intersections and I think, oh wow, how does that affect my being? It's not a straight on, this is a bridge and we walk through it. But, but there's a lot of emotion coming out of that piece. The same thing with, uh, uh, Trump, the obscure, that speaks to me emotionally because I am not a big Trump supporter. I think he has brought out the worst of, of this country. He has divided us in such a way. And to me, he's the Antichrist. He's opened the door for Jesus coming back. When I look at that, I see the starkness of it. It sickens me. Not not that the art sickens me, but the emotion of seeing this man who is in a hood, uh, that's who he is to me. So emotionally, I'm uh, not happy. But then when I look at your East L.A. and the mountains and, and, and the houses, it, it makes me feel happy. So in looking at your art... What I see are all these individual pieces that have a specific emotion. Who in your life, once you started doing this, became your mentor to help you in the art world to navigate to having a career? Sister Karen Bacalero helped me. Okay. But there's another person in between there, and that's Don Chipper Chipperfield. He wasn't training me to be a Chicano artist, and he was one of the instructors at East L.A. College. What he taught me were a couple of things. And he thought European art, not Chicano art. He taught me how to look. We, there's, there was a special section reserved with these wonderful books, and you could go in there, but you couldn't check them out. But he and I would go into the section of the library. He would literally teach me how to turn a page without damaging the book. Because, you know, being a Chicano, I'm going... <laughs> No, Robert, that's not the way you have it. You're going to ruin that book. What do you mean, man? 
No, this is the way you turn the book. And look at the way that painted. So he would describe to me how to look. I go to self-help graphics and I'm meeting a new philosophy, which is Sister Karen, and I meet all these artists that I would not have met otherwise. Uh, Sister Karen was an artist? Was an artist in her own right. And uh, I forget, the, she was influenced by this very famous nun herself, I, I, uh, something Kent. Uh, Sister Kent uh, became a serigraph artist, and then Sister Karen... What is a serigraph artist? It, oh, you learn to do these drawings on a screen, on a silk oh, screen. Oh, a silk screen. A silk screen. Wow. And so Karen comes with these ideas. Fast forward, the self-help graphic is up and running. I meet Sister Karen. She introduces me to serigraphs, which I don't know anything about, etching, monoprint. And along the way are all these wonderful artists. Some of these guys, man, they could just draw anything. Shh, these screens. That's where I got sort of my Chicano painting mm -hmm. idea. I was doing abstractions for a while, like from, and that's where the black and white comes in. Like from uh, Franz Klein, abstract expression is from the 40s to, to the 50s. And Jackson Pollock and Sister Karen would say, Roberto, why are you doing that shit when you should be painting the barrio? So I stopped doing abstractions and, and, there, and I started doing the barrio. And I was doing it anyway, a little bit, but less on my own. But anyway, she sort of kicked me in the keister and motivated to do the... What do you like about therapy? Everything. I like the attention, number one. I'm paying the guy for it. I find out a lot of things about myself that I would not otherwise know about myself, and it shocks the hell out of me. I also like the fact that I can ask questions to see if what I'm thinking is reality or if it's just in my head. And that's really important for me from where, from the Vietnam War up to the present, I'm saying, am what I'm thinking right or am I just crazy? Uh, are my interpretations of reality is what reality is or is it not? That's what I like about therapy. Therapy, I get to ask those questions. So do you use therapy as a, a learning or as a um, accountability? Both. If you've got a good therapist, he or she's not going to let you get away with anything. They're the mirror. Mm -hmm. You're paying them. They have no axe to grind, so you can't get pissed off with them. They're just there to give you your reality, a reality check. What kind of advice would you give a young artist out there? Maybe three things you would tell them to either look out for or pay attention to or to just um, help them on their journey. Have a goal. Have a vision. Have a goal. Be persistent and get somebody that has no ax to grind to be your advisor. Those three things. What's your favorite medium of paint? Ah, acrylic paint. I started with oils. I, I didn't want to deal with the mess. Acrylic paint because it dries fast. With acrylics, you have less room for mistakes. Yes and no. Okay. Because gesso is your eraser. You get white gesso, you paint right over that spot. What let is it that? Dry. It's a white paint, but there's, uh, there's chalk mix into it. Okay. And that's a foundation. If you make a mistake in the center of your paint, you have to have the courage to paint over as much as you need to, let it dry because it is acrylic, and paint right over it. Oh, okay. I just learned a new thing. What do you want your legacy to be? I try to be an honest painter. What I paint is from my heart to the canvas, an honest painter. Mm. At the end of the day, what do you want your art to do? I don't know if it'll do anything. Uh, my art is autobiographical. Everything that you see here, it's all about me. That's just the way it turned out. If, when you look at the drawings or paintings, if, and I hope that I get a ret, an art retrospective, you're going to see Roberto Gutierrez on the wall, but I hope you also see that I did the very best that I could with that paint and those drawings. That they're, they're, as a painter, as a draftsman, well, he did pretty damn well with that drawing. Oh, look at that. That's what I want. If someone is listening right now who has PTSD, what would you say to them to help them? Be persistent. Don't give up. There's help for you out there. It could be the VA, but there are other organizations as well uh, in the community, whatever community that is. Be persistent. Now you have the internet. Look up whatever it is. Don't give up. Don't, don't live out there out in the streets and stuff 
if you're out in the streets, go to the VA directly first because they have all these experts that can help you or guide you in the direction that you need to go. In case you're interested, Self-Help Graphics is an organization down in East LA that works with a lot of artists, a lot of Chicano artists. They are an iconic organization in that they've been around since the 60s and they've produced um, incredible artists and they also serve the community and they're also a great place to go get t-shirts if you want silk screening done. Um, they're amazing. Uh, you definitely should use them.